really nice to see all of you. I see a few familiar faces and lots of new ones. Um, so uh, the, the kind of strategy of the program tonight will be a, an overview of the evolution of the uh, of the courthouse or the county home um, to set the stage a bit. But we do want to talk a little bit more about um, who lived there and um, get a little bit more you know, personalized the experience a little bit and talk about how the historian's office and others have continue to learn about the, the courthouse and the associated cemeteries on that property. Um, first, we'll do, uh, I do want to do a little word association um, exercise at the beginning and the end, um, just to we'll kind of frame the, the presentation that way. So um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else about myself I can really add to that. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm really happy to be in the position of county historian. I've been having a lot of fun. Uh, working on some new presentations and other projects around. So um, obviously I'm always there to answer any questions and I have some brochures here to hand out afterward like that. So um, just a quick word association and I know some of you may have thought about this and may have some may not, but what are some words or ideas that you may associate with the idea of courthouse? I'll just jot them down up here. Well, I have money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Widows and orphans. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> what do you think of Margaret? Man. 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 Yeah. Single man. You know, veterans. Okay. Yep. Right. Yeah. Or like county home, maybe. Yeah, definitely. That's the word that a lot of people got to know um, as time went on, evolution marches on. Right? Poor, yeah. poor mental health. Mm. Transients have never got any further. <laughs> what was that? Tra transients? Transients have never got any further. Mm -hmm. I think that was the thing. Oh, so first thing that happened when I had. Uh huh. Okay. That's a yeah, definitely. He had a lot to say about that, kind of about poverty and um, and difficulty in life. Yeah, these are wonderful. Any last ones? It covers it pretty well, actually. <laughs> so it, it, this, you can see a, a range of ideas here. There's some kind of sad and difficult things, um, some and and some really advanced ideas for what we have today, like poor mental health. We'll probably talk about that quite a bit. Um, if you want to turn lights down and we can see the presentation, I just wanted to be able to see this board for um, the moment. We'll come back to that. So the courthouse can have a really difficult history, but the historical records that we are lucky enough to have can help us continue to understand more and more about the, the property and um, the people who lived there so that they're not forgotten. Um, the courthouse has developed over time, as ideas have developed over time. And as people have learned more about uh, disabilities and mental health and um, sociology, it, it did its best to provide for people. That's what I like to think. Even though um, ideas have shifted enough that um, uh, we think maybe they didn't always do the best job. But. So a little background. Um, this is a photo of State Street in Monday. It's not taken before the 1820s, so I didn't have an image from that really, obviously. Um, but it sets the stage. So before the 1820s, um, when someone needed extra assistance um, in their town, they uh, it was all everything was handled at the town level with with money that was raised by taxes in the town. So each town, including Nunday and Portage, um, they each had an overseer of the poor. That was a, a appointed official who, um, for a year or two term, would. Um, be the person to go to if you needed extra help. So you'd go tell them what was going on for you, and uh, they, this is simplistic, but then they would go to the supervisor of the town, um, and they would ass assess whether you deserved, basically, some, some extra money, um, and usually that, that meant giving you some money or clothes or fuel to, to help you through the hard times. Um, obviously, that didn't come without some judgment. There was... Um, there were moral judgments about this, so certain people may not be eligible depending on their behavior or their track record in life. Um, so it's it's not it was not a perfect system, um, but that's how it was done from kind of colonial times up into the nineteen or eighteen twenties. Um, so in early in eighteen twenty four, the New York State um, Poorhouse Law was passed, which established a poorhouse in several different counties across the state, and it wasn't all of them. 
So Livingston County was on the list, to, and they were supposed to build um, suitable buildings on enough acreage to build a farm. And this is uh, introduced the idea of county responsibility before that, because it had been only at the town level that people were taken care of. This new idea was if you were from a town in that county, um, it was centralized a bit. Uh, so the so Livingston County started eventually got to work on on um, complying with this law, and they in 1828 they were advertising for a farm um, to place the buildings on on this notice on the left. Uh, they were looking for something under you know 150 or 200 acres so that they could establish a working and operating farm and build buildings um, to centralize this care. Um, in 1829, the, the buildings were built and ready for occupancy in the, in the summer. That was 194 years ago, which is kind of interesting to think about. We're coming up on the 200th of that. Um, so this excludes Nunday and Portage, actually. So if you know anything about town borders, um, they're very confusing. So I don't expect you to remember all the dates and when and who and what happened. Um, but at that point in the 1820s, Nunday and Portage were both part of Allegheny County. So Allegheny County was actually one of the accepted counties from the courthouse law. They weren't, they weren't told immediately to build a centralized um, facility for the care of, of people. Um, but in 1831, they did opt in, and the, um, the Allegheny County Courthouse was constructed in Angelica. Um, I don't know, has anyone been down that way and seen those old dilapidated buildings? I, I did it one time, and I, you know, had to do the right thing and ask permission to go in. And the person's like, "Oh, the caretaker's not here today," so I didn't get to look at them. Um, but there were uh, that, that was the old buildings. They were made of brick um, on the left, the Allegheny County Courthouse. They all burned to the ground in the 1920s and were actually all rebuilt. So the ones that you see there today, um, they look they look different. Um, so anyone who lived in Allegheny or in um, Nunday or Portage back then before 1846 when those two towns were, were taken into Livingston County, um, they may have, have gone to this facility, they may have lived there, and there was and still is a cemetery. So when people passed away there, they may have been buried there too. After 1846, those towns were came into Livingston County, and the Livingston County Courthouse was built in Geneseo, outside, just outside of the village. Um, it's now on Route 20A, if you know that at all. So probably a good time. But what do you what do you think a few reasons might be that someone would go to actually live at this facility, the farm and the buildings? Uh, we talked about a few of them, so some of those probably relate. Um, any other additions to why someone might be there? Uh, if they were injured, like say if a uh, uh, farm worker was injured, yeah. they had no source of income. Very good. Couldn't work. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely a reason a lot of people would go, kind of like for rehabilitation, to go get well, um, especially if they didn't have other people to help out on their farm and help them get better. Yeah. My relatives came from England to Canada to Michigan to Genesee Courthouse. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So sometimes in the when you're when you're traveling from you know, escaping maybe potentially from a, from persecution or some economic trouble in, a, in your home country and you spend a lot of time traveling, by the time you get here, you don't have much left and you don't have a way of establishing yourself. And so you might rely on this system to help you get on your feet. So excellent additions. And plus some of the ideas here that um, reasons people might have been struggling. So if you read some of the records that we're lucky enough to have, um, they, the, the words that they used for the reasons why people were there were not just like injured or, you know, whatever. They, they, um, some of the words we would maybe consider kind of inappropriate today, and it's just that euphemism treadmill is what, what we know it as, words changing over time. It's kind of like how shell shock became PTSD over time for the few stages in between. Um, so they, they would they call people insane. Um, they, they, when a young woman would have a child out of wedlock, she, might, uh, she would be there for debauchery. Um, kind of really inappropriate and words that um, that don't tell the whole story at all. But it is interesting to see how the words have changed over time. And it also reflects the ideas of the time um, and the judgments on the moral character of people that I had mentioned before. Um, so not everyone may have gotten the help that they needed, unfortunately, because they, you know, not everyone, some people were considered like, oh, you're not eligible for help because you just, you know, you're, you're a bad person. <laughs> Simple as that, I guess. So, 
Once um, Dundee and Portage joined the county, um, 1849, the, from 1829 to 1849 or so, the um, county courthouse rested on across from where it is today, so the south side of Route 20A in Geneseo. Today there is um, there's a little there's a brick house there. Actually, it's on my next slide, so you'll see it in a second. But um, the in the, when the, the first one that we, we don't have an image of, I guess I'll just skip ahead to it and go back. They're out of order. Um, this, this brick house is there today. This is a little bit older photo. Um, and it's, uh, it's surrounded by Denny's and banks and things like that. It's pretty odd to have a home there, but it is a home. That's the site of the original county home um, and farm on um, that south side of the road. On the north side, they, they did own, the county owned um, property across the road for agricultural purposes, but all the buildings were on the south side. Um, I believe this building was probably built by this fellow over here, Daniel Bissell. Um, he purchased the land um, when the, the county home had overgrown, or it could be, had grown too large for that spot. They needed to build new buildings on, this, on the north side where it is today. Daniel Bissell purchased the land um, and I believe he probably built this house around 1850 or so. So probably none of the original buildings exist from the courthouse um, before 1849. Um, so Daniel, interesting story here. So every, all the buildings uh, were on that side and there was an open, a very early cemetery because as soon as you have people living in that facility, you're gonna have some people pass away. Some were buried in local cemeteries if their families could care for them, but some were uh, buried on county property. So at the back of this, where this house is today, somewhere back in here, about where Reservoir Road is, or near there, um, there was a cemetery. And Daniel Bissell was upset by having a cemetery on his new land. He was not interested in having them there, and asked the county to, to remove the burials to the new side of the road, to the north side, where the, the new courthouse was going to be. And they said, okay, sure, and they took whatever headstones were there and removed them. And he complained that no one had ever actually removed the burials and interred the people on the other side of the road. And they eventually settled for $200 and, as far as I know, left the, left the cemetery there um, to be overgrown and eventually lost to time. There is a rumor that certain things maybe came to the surface eventually when there was development near Reservoir Road, and I can't can't corroborate that, but um, that cemetery is, is basically gone at this point, which is pretty sad. Um, but that building still stands as a reminder of where the courthouse began. Um, I will flip back to this one. This is the 1850 building. It's we, we think of it as the East Building, if you know. So on Millennium Drive, toward Walmart, between like all of the the sprawl in Geneseo and between and to Walmart, there are three brick buildings in a row. Um, this is the earliest one on the East End. Um, and that was built in the 1850s, so they quickly needed to expand, but at first there, this housed everyone, so that the person who lived there to take care of people and manage everyday things lived in the center portion with his family, and then uh, men and women lived on these wings separate. So everyone lived in this, in this one building. Uh, you can see a few barns back here, but otherwise, this is one of the earliest pictures, probably from the 1870s or so. So, uh, sadly, on the back of this building was a little um, wooden structure where people who were considered kind of violent or unpredictable, uh, the insane, were kept in kind of cells, really. Um, and in 1868, there was a big fire, um, and sadly, five women passed away in that fire um, because they couldn't escape, or if they, I think one was helped out, but ran back in. So it was a huge tragedy, and at this point, people were understanding that um, you, needed, you needed more space, you needed to care for people a little bit better. So they expanded, uh, we that, um, expanded to a, build another building, which was intended to house people with met, severe mental illness. Um, this is now the middle building, if you know those, those three buildings. Um, and that was built in the 18, uh, 1868, right after the fire, and addition built on shortly after. So in the 1870s, um, more uh, people, the State Board of Charities was starting to oversee these facilities a bit to make sure that people were being cared for as best as they knew how. Things were clean, things were operating well, people had the basics, what they needed. Um, and before this, a lot of children passed through the courthouse also. It wasn't just single men or, or um, 
women who had lost a husband or something like that. There were children too. And um, they lived in close proximity with all kinds of people. And they had a school, but it was not understood to be really the best place for children after a while. So William Pryor Letchworth was a commissioner and then a president of the State Board of Charities, which oversaw the facilities like um, jails and poorhouses and um, asylums. And he lobbied hard to get children out of poorhouses, um, county, the county facilities, because he felt children needed, um, needed to be reared by a family, if possible, obviously, and given an education better than what they were getting, and to be housed separately from people who are having some mental crises. Um, so eventually, New York State passed the Children's, um, the Children's Act in 1875, and children, if they couldn't be placed with a family in sort of a semi-foster situation, um, they were taken to the Rochester Orphan Asylum, and trying to find a home for them was really the goal. Um, caring for children when they could be cared for by a family, it's kind of easier to place a child with a family to be taken care of, and then they, are, they effectively work for the family too. Um, it was called being bound out, so a family would agree to take a child and have them work a bit, but also they would feed them, clothe them, and give them an education. Um, obviously, the county preferred that because then they weren't just paying to keep a child in a really unsuitable situation. Um, so William Pryor Lashworth was really influential in making that happen. So in 1879, this is the last building, and you'll recognize that one. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's been renovated since. We'll get to that. But um, this brick building was built in, 18, in 1879 and was meant to be uh, the men's building eventually. Um, so they, they finally spread out a little bit. That first building on the east, when it, 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 it housed everyone at first, and then eventually it just became offices and the residence of the superintendent of the poor, who was the person managing the day-to-day -day stuff with his family. Um, the middle building was for women, and then this one was for men. So it was quite a bit bigger. Um, but the population in the 1870s was at its highest point almost, um, with, I have it written down somewhere, 100 and some people. Uh, 165 residents were, were there in the 1870s. That was its highest point. Um, and a lot of people were there because of pretty severe mental illness. They weren't able to live on their own um, or were, were um, placed there. So all the people who were designated as insane in the 1890s were removed to Willard, um, which was a basically, in a, they, well, they called it an insane asylum at the time. Uh, Willard is near Rome, open New York area. And so the population fell a great deal. It was a lot smaller because they just realized that the, the people with mental illness weren't being cared for well enough in these county places. Um, so that changed quite a bit. So now we've talked about the three buildings. This is an older map to help uh, illustrate the, the entire property. So the east building here, the women's building in the middle, and the men's building on the end here to the west. But there are a lot of other buildings, you can see. Um, this is kind of a snapshot into this little complex here. These are all barns and outbuildings. Um, this is actually a map of the sewer system, <laughs> but it also shows all the outbuildings, which is helpful. So um, remember, it was meant to be an operating farm, and it, it did operate as a farm from the 1820s to the 1950s, which is a long time um, to, to have that going on. And they produced quite a lot of the food that they actually used at the facility. Also provided, um, they, they may have, they sold a little bit if they needed to, um, provided other county um, facilities with it, such as the jail. They, they sold some eggs and milk to the jail. And so they had chickens and pigs and um, horses, work horses, um, and they cultivated the fields around the, the farm. So they, they provided quite a lot for themselves. They were trying to keep the costs as low as possible, obviously, and so it was helpful to have um, some of the produce and um, meat and eggs and things feed the people who were living there, as well as the people who were able to were expected to work. And it wasn't um, what in England they call a workhouse, per se. Um, you weren't forced to work, but if you were able, you were expected to. Um, obviously, there were many people who had injuries or who were too elderly or um, weren't really, weren't really ready to work. Um, uh, but those who, did, those who could would be out plowing the fields and planting and harvesting and um, processing the food that they grew there. So here's a, a great picture I actually just received from a donor. Um, I had a photocopy before, but I have a, a much better image. It's really the, it's the, one of the only images we have of people who are actually in the building. 
Um, if you know the window, oops, if you know the windows at all, they're in the they're in the West Building, which was for men. This is a little bit later. Um, it's the early 1960s or so. Um, but it doesn't look very comfortable to you. It really it doesn't to me. Um, it looks like it's pretty crowded and maybe kind of dark. It probably didn't smell great in its worst days. Um, so it may not have been the nicest place to live, especially in the earlier days before more modern conveniences. Um, I still believe that people were trying to do their best when they were running these places, um, but we know that we know we just know more today, right? <laughs> we're still learning every day too. It's not like we know everything about mental health and and well overall wellness. We're always learning. Um, and through, so through the early 20th century, old age was trending um, as far as the reason why people were there. It's a bit of a catch-all term because with age comes other um, other health concerns. So people were there for a variety of reasons, but instead of just being destitute um, or, or being sick, they, sometimes they could, people could be cared for more at home. And that's what was, that's what it was going, they were going for in the 20th, in the 20th century. Um, this, these are also part of the, the new collection that we received. So this is a closed storage area in the barber shop um, and the doctor's office in the middle building with lots of very questionable <laughs> medicines on the, on the shelves. Um, so they tried to do what they could in-house for people, but uh, with the 1930s, the new public welfare law and other laws were, were shifting things a bit. Um, it was there was less uh, emphasis on having people go to live at the poor farm, and because it was pretty expensive to, to um, take care of somebody through everything on that property, it was easier if they could be supported yeah, at home, um, if possible, to get well um, or to be cared for. Um, just If you just needed a little money for food or fuel or clothes, um, doing that at home is just a much more uh, comfortable, probably, and inexpensive thing for the county. Um, new, the terminology was also changing. It became the county home, and superintendent of the poor was scratched out. They had the um, they had the commissioner of welfare. Um, so things were changing through that time period, and the population was dropping too. Um, in 1956, the farm stopped working. Um, they stopped operating. Sold some of those buildings, the outbuildings, and it really had become more of a nursing home. And so in the 60s. Um, this is an overhead view of today's town of Geneseo offices and a few other county um, agencies. Uh, Millennium Drive is actually not there yet, maybe. I think it goes right here now. So this picture is from about the early 80s. This is hard to see, but the, the poorhouse complex is back here, at least the, the last two buildings. And these are holes in the roof um, of what is now a strange design. So they were the, the buildings were used for another decade or so after this new county home and infirmary was built. Um, really, it was meant to be the county's first nursing home. Um, that's what the courthouse had kind of become, the, the kind of people that needed it most. And um, so they, they built this new one-story facility that was much more modern. It still wasn't a hospital like they had always, the chair, Board of Charities was always saying they needed to build, but it was more better equipped to care for people in their um, older age. Um, the last, there were a few residents who had been living in here. They were moved into this new building, and the county offices did occupy the, the brick buildings for about 10 years or so, um, but eventually they were falling apart, and so they, they abandoned those. So, um, any questions about that hurried timeline so far? <laughs> we're going to get to a little bit more uh, to personalize this experience just a little bit. Um, so we're really lucky to have some documents that um, are crucial to understanding more about who lived there and what their experience might have been like. There are obviously lots of questions still, but, um, but yeah, come on in, hi. Sorry, oh, totally fine. You might, be, you might be a little bit at sea, but we're going to talk about some people who lived at the courthouse and their experience. Um, I just did a timeline of the, of the property. Um, so. I mentioned the cemetery that is no longer on the south side of Route 20A. Um, there are two cemeteries that still exist today. Um, one of them is the, the first one that they built in 1850, when or established in 1850 when they built the, the first brick building. So this is looking uh, behind the whole complex, so now it's backwards, the east, middle, and west building. It's a strange design now, um, and Ophelian. 
Um, so there's this, this cemetery dates from about 1850 to about 1907, and then they created a new space for more burials along what is now Volunteer Road. Um, so those headstones are, uh, there are a couple of them. They have, in, they have initials and an age usually on them. So there are two existing cemeteries. And like I mentioned, if people were at the, living at the facility and passed away, if they had relatives who could um, pay for their burial in a ill local cemetery, that's what happened. But sadly, there were some people who just didn't have the money or they didn't, um, the, they were never claimed by family or friends and ended up being buried on county property. So they're still there in one of these cemeteries. Is there a map or a documentation of who's where? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, there is some, sometimes, <laughs> to some extent, and I will, I'll talk a little bit about that, actually, just about now. So, one of the, one of the absolutely crucial documents that we have in our collection, and we were lucky enough to get quite a lot of records from the courthouse, not everything that I would like to have, of course, but this one is really important, it's um, what they call the Deaths County Home. So this is a record book that was started in the 1870s when the state required it, finally. <clears throat> and it records everyone who passed away, the date, their age, where they, what town they came from, the cause of their death, and where they were buried. So that, obviously that document is really, really helpful to learning a little bit more about these cemeteries and who's buried there. Um, the handwriting is obviously can look like hieroglyphics, but with some practice and <laughs> with a few different pairs of eyes, you can um, you can learn from it a lot. Um, so, so back into the cemetery. What do you first notice about this stone? It's just a number. That's right. That's pretty much what I was looking for. Yeah, it's a small, simple stone, and it's just a number. Um, mostly, we think of gravestones with a name and an age and some nice little epitaph, but um, these ones were just, that's all they put on them. And there's some reasons why perhaps it's, it was just cheaper to carve something simple rather than a whole name. Sometimes they may not have known the person's name. And there's also a theory, I'm not entirely sure if it was this reason or not, but to um, destigmatize or kind of hide the identity of the person who was buried there because it was ignominious. It was like, it wasn't... Um, it was sad, and, they, and you wouldn't want to know, have, your, have everyone know that your relative was buried there. Or you wouldn't want you to, be, to know that you were buried there. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. They never recorded a reason for why they decided to do a numbering system, but it's extremely common in other um, cemeteries associated with poorhouses. Um, so the, the book, as I mentioned, back to it again quickly, there's one column right here. They don't all have anything, they don't all have something filled out in that column. I know it's tiny, sorry. Sometimes, sometimes it's blank, sometimes there's a number in it. And so that was our breakthrough moment, and to answer your question a bit, it does help us understand who is actually buried at the cemetery. Even though the gravestones don't say it, the book does tell us a number attached to a name. Um, we're happy about this to know a little bit more. We are sad that it took them until 1870s to start recording this kind of thing. Um, before that time, we have some notices of when people died at the courthouse, but we don't always know if they were buried there or somewhere else. So we have to kind of guess at the numbers, but we don't know all of the names, which is too bad. But the people, yeah. Which is okay as long as you have the block. Right? Yeah, well, from 1877 to the 1920s, we have a really good idea of who's buried there. It amounts to about 320 names. Um, but before that and a little bit after that, it's a little sketchier. So I'm still, I'm still grateful that we have it. <laughs> It does, it does give us a glimpse into who might be there and their stories. So based on this book and a lot of other records that we have, we can do a little bit of a case study because those buried there are real people with real stories, complex lives. Um, so Christopher and Eliza Jane Smith, are uh, they came to the courthouse in the 1890s. Uh, they were an older couple from West Sparta, but really just over the line from Nunday on Moore Road, if you know where that is. Um, Eliza Jane lived on that road practically her whole life. She grew up there, and eventually when she and Christopher were married, they, they lived there. Um, so they were, yeah, they were really close to, um, they were on Byersville Monday Road, near Byersville Monday Road. And um, so she and Christopher never ended up having any children. Um, here, I can use my pointer too. Here's Monday Byersville Road. 
Moore Road is where they were living. Um, this is an 1852 map, so it was, I think, right before they were married, but Eliza Jane's father is right here, G. Cox, that's his little house, and so she lived right about here most of her life, like that little spot. So this is West Sparta, this is Nunday, so they're very close. Um, so uh, Eliza Jane um, cared for her mother, they both cared for her mother Catherine, and Catherine lived to 102, mm -hmm. so they were... Uh, that's really what was expected of people instead of going to a nursing home, as you might today. Uh, you were expected to care for your elders and other relatives in need. <clears throat> and so the, the, the Smiths cared for um, their mother and mother-in-law, respectively. And it sounded like they were really a sweet, uh, they cared for her a lot. They, in, her, in her mother, Eliza's mother's obituary, it said that they most faithfully and lovingly ministered to her wants which makes you feel like they, they really did care about her and they did what they could. So when they came to the poorhouse, it, was, it just said that they, were, they came there because of old age. And because of that, they probably did have some health things going on too. But I mean, sure, a bunch of you probably have um, known someone who spent time in a rehab, rehabilitation center or a nursing home. Um, that's what we would do today. And that's, that's one of the roles of the poorhouse at that time. So. Because they didn't have any children, the Smiths um, didn't have any other relatives either at that point. They were getting pretty elderly. Um, so they needed to have someone take care of them. And so they had to go to the poorhouse, which is pretty stigmatizing, but that was one of the reasons why people were there. And Tom did mention that I was going to talk about the, the barrel. <laughs> this is a pretty good time to mention that as sort of another case study along the same lines. So the barrel was made by a man named John Perry who lived in Portage, um, near, near Hunt, I guess. He's buried in Penny Cook Cemetery, which is in Portage. And um, he, he came in to live at the poorhouse or the county home by that point in 1915 when he was in his 80s. And I don't have a lot of records about him. He, he um, actually went home again in, um, after a few months of living at the poorhouse. And apparently he passed away there, but he did spend time at the poorhouse, which makes me think he probably was getting over an illness, um, or maybe his rather elderly wife couldn't take care of him for a while and he had to go live there. Um, but I think it sounds like it's a pretty similar case, that he wasn't there because he had mental health trouble or because he didn't want to work and was impoverished. It was just because he was older and needed a little extra care, as many of us will. <laughs> Um, so that was John Perry, and I wish I had more for you, Tom, but he made the barrel, and because he was a cooper, he made barrels for a living, and by then he was just pretty elderly, so um, he wasn't making barrels anymore, but the barrel came here to be at the museum, so go look for it after, I think is my message. If you want to add anything, Tom, please do. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we look at the barrel. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> So Eliza Jane and Christopher uh, both passed away at the courthouse, unlike John Perry. They did not go back to their home because they were in their later 80s and, um, and they both had some health things. So they passed away within about three weeks of each other, which is kind of sad to think about. Um, they probably couldn't even live together in that facility because the men and women were supposed to live separately. They didn't have a place for married couples. Um, so Christopher's grave, if you remember that stone we saw a second ago, if I go back, is it there? Yes. He, he, uh, the number written by his name in that big reference, in that big record book is 123. So, I mean, I can't know for absolute sure, but I'm quite sure that this is Christopher's stone. And because of some misnumbering in that record book, um, if I'm not positive which one Eliza Jane's number should be. Um, but because they passed away within three weeks of each other, I'm pretty sure it's number 124. And in the cemetery, that stone, there was no 124. They just couldn't find it. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. I guess sometimes these discrepancies happen. And then, um, so I was, they're clearing out around the cemetery last summer, and I was poking around, as I do. I'm like, what's going on back here? And um, I found a stone and flipped it over, and it was 124. It's way at the top of the cemetery, so like as far away as possible from where Christopher is supposedly buried. So I, you know, all I, all I could do was get some help. We moved the stone down to, to lie next to number 123, just to feel like they could be together, their stones could be together. Nice. Yeah. And then um, even more luck after that, I was talking to the West Sparta Town historian, um, and we got a photo 
which I thought is it's one of the most unique photos I've ever seen. It's a picture of the Smiths. Oh. And it's the only photo I think, well, one of the only photos that I can I have of someone who lived at the courthouse. Um, I think that's I think it's just the sweetest thing. What are some of the things you notice about this photo? They're together. They're together. <laughs> that's the best part, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously their you know their their clothes are not new. They have been through quite a lot of times in their lives, I'm sure. What strikes me most probably is just how sweet they are. It's one of the most intimate pictures I think I've seen in historical collections. Most people are, I mean, photography being what it was, people sit kind of stiffly next to each other. So I always enjoy when I see a picture of people laughing together or something. But they're just so sweet and clearly care about each other a lot. Um, so I think about marriage and love and, um, and caring for one another when I see this photo. And it's really impactful because it, it's easier to imagine what people's lives were like after seeing a photo like this and that they're real people just like us. They have complex lives, they have ups and downs, um, but it made me feel like the cemetery is all the more worth caring for because there are unique people who had lives who are, who are buried there and they've mostly been forgotten otherwise um, if we don't learn more about them. So we can continue learning more about the the cemetery and help preserve the buildings um, and the cemetery to, to dignify and remember the people who live there and who are buried there. So some photos of the before. <laughs> this is the Whoa. West Building, um, strange design today. This is the East Building, um, where Scent and Stone and Expression Salon and Michaela's Quilting are. And um, actually one of the ways still looks like this in the East Building. It hasn't been renovated much, which is interesting. It has lots of little rooms, door here, door here, and this, like, um, I don't know, there's a walkway, catwalk kind of thing up around it. And so this, and this building was in awful shape. It had huge holes in the roof, and, um, and I, I'm amazed that it was able to be saved. But, so this is what they looked like in the 1980s, really dilapidated. The Board of Supervisors of Livingston <coughs> County, um, they, the county still owned this property, too, at that point, and so they considered demoing the whole thing because it was just pretty far gone, um, and the cost of maintenance was so great um, to, to be able to bring them back up. But it did spark a local preservation effort, so there were a group got together and, and advocated enough that a developer purchased um, all three buildings from the county. And the first one to open was the middle building. Of course, I don't have a photo of that one in here, but it became the Oak Valley Inn. Um, and that opened in the late 1980s, and it's been running ever since. So, uh, in 2010, uh, Greg O'Connell is a is a well-known developer in this area. Purchased the property and has um, in, got some grants and and actually saw potential in these old buildings, uh, even though they were in really really bad shape. And um, so here's the West Building, the Men's Building, today Strange Design. Um, and that opened a couple uh, year ago, a couple years ago already. Two years ago, yeah. <laughs> they have plans for the third floor. That I'm not positive about. It's I think it's it's renovated enough to be used as a yoga studio once in a while, but it's not um, it's not fully functional or hasn't been um, it hasn't been promoted as a usable space yet. But it is fairly it's fixed up a bit, yeah. Um, I think the only part that isn't completely fixed up is one of the wings on the easternmost building. Otherwise, they've all been renovated. They're all, um, they're mostly filled by businesses today, all occupied. So that was really major. And when this one especially was renovated, it hadn't been, there had been no ma major renovation since it had been built in the 1870s. So it had a lot of work to be done. Um, but it's a, it's a neat place. Uh, just being in there, it's one of my favorites. The atmosphere is really interesting. Yeah. Do you know why the windows are eight feet tall and two feet wide in this building? Uh, they're even narrower on the east building, so my guess is to prevent people from getting out. From jumping out. Okay. Yeah. These ones are, they are still wide enough to get out of, so I'm not really sure. They're kind of sealed in. Um, if you're inside, it's a, it's, a brick, it's a brick wall, right? So it's pretty thick. Um, there's a sloping sill, um, which makes me think it would be hard to get out of it, but um, I think it's also just a design feature. It's kind of gothic. So they ever had bars on them? Maybe they had bars on them. Maybe not on this one that I know of, but um, some of the ones, especially in the first building, where they had everybody at one time, they had to provide the correct space for anyone who was going through anything. 
And those those uh, windows are extremely narrow, like you basically couldn't fit out of them. And they did have something like cells in the building too, um, where, where people were kept if they were thought to be violent. Um, so there was, that was that was part of the design, I think. <laughs> um, but this is also just Gothic, kind of Gothic architecture. So I think the tall windows, kind of uh, the pointy roof, that's just part of the architectural style as well. One more question on the, yeah. on the building. Uh -huh. um, I've noticed, because I, I, I ate there once, mm -hmm. it's very narrow. It's tall and very narrow, but long. Mm -hmm. well, why was the design like that? Was it because they had long dormitories inside? Yes, actually, that more or less like that. I, I don't have a diagram to show everybody, but since a few of you have been in there, I can, I can try to describe it too. Um, so there, yes, there was a kind of a wide hallway going down the center of the building. Uh, it would be going long ways like this. Uh, when you go in, there's there's sort of a lobby now, but uh, that may have been the case in the past too. What I like about the renovation is it has changed, but you can still see uh, remnants of the original um, structure and where rooms were, where doors were, and the windows haven't changed. Um, so they did it sensitively, I think, um, while still making it into a space where you can have a restaurant, which is it's difficult. But so the long down the, down the center of the building, like from here, this window inside, there was a big long hallway, and then there would have been small rooms on either side, kind of like a college dorm. So, oh, okay. So like one room for each window? Yes, I think so. It's hard to tell. You can, you can see differences in the bricks on the walls. So you can right. see where there may have been partitions before. Um, the bar in the very center uh, has, a, has a wall kind of in the middle of it, and, and sort of uh, a doorway has been created in it. But that is part of the original structure. So you can see glimpses of where the, where the hallway was, where all the rooms were off to each side of the hallway. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it was no. narrow, and the rooms were not big. <laughs> so there really wasn't a dorm, dormitory you know, with one big room. They had little rooms. They had little rooms, but I don't think that they were single occupancy. I think they probably oh. had a few people in each one. Oh, right. And, and when the Board of Charities was writing their reports about things that, that really the county should do to care for everyone better, they always said the men have to sit in the hallway. They don't have a sitting room. Oh, and okay. kind of like that photograph of the men sitting in the hallway, I think that was the case as long as this building was built and occupied right. as the poorhouse. Um, it was designed for occupancy, but not like, wasn't a comfortable place to be necessarily. Um, any other questions about the building? I'm not an architect, I'm sorry, but I'm happy to try. <laughs> Neither am I. Okay. It is very fascinating. And I love I love creeping around in here and being like, oh sorry, I can't order. I'm just like looking at how the brick color is on this wall. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, yeah. Um, so in 2021, um, we it was the bicentennial of Livingston County, and this is my predecessor Amy Alden, who you have have met and known. She's still around, she just retired. Um, but she, uh, she and I helped to uh, do a, one of our bicentennial events was centered around the courthouse and the cemetery. And this was kind of the big announcement that we had that book that told us a little bit about um, who was buried at these stones anyway. Um, so we did a, a kind of a ceremony where we read the names that we did know. We had people in the community each read a, a, a number of names until we had read all 320. And it felt really nice to do that, just to speak their names for the first time in over 100 years in many cases. Um, and then acknowledging that there are many more people who, who don't know what their name was, um, or that if they are there or not. Um, these were my waterlogged name tags that I stuck in each one of these just before a thunderstorm. Um, they looked great before <laughs> the thunderstorm. <laughs> Uh, but that was labeling each one with a name and the dates of the people. Yes. And not just a number anymore. Right. Not just a number. At least the ones we can we can name. Um, so we had an event where people could walk into the cemetery after the after the ceremony, and it felt really nice um, to recognize it in that way. But obviously, there's still always more to learn. So kind of another shot of the same. It's a little easier to see here. So. These each have their number, like we talked about. There is actually one or two anomalies in the corner where there's somebody's name on the cemetery on the stone. But otherwise, they're all numbers, more or less in order, <clears throat> except for this fellow up here. I'm not sure why he's out of order. There will always be a mystery. Um, these are the these are the more recent burials, but up toward the back, 
Um, this is where they would have begun burying people in 1850. And as you can see, all open, right? No, no stones except for this guy. Um, so what you can see when it when um, it snows a little bit or when leaves are blowing across the ground, they catch in kind of regular little spaces um, up there where there are no gravestones. So no, and also knowing just by um, by statistic statistically from what we do know how many people are buried there, there are more graves than there are stones by quite a bit. Um, so this summer, finally going to hopefully make it happen. We're going to have a totally non-intrusive um, ground penetrating radar survey um, done in both of the existing cemeteries. So that's somebody with this machine that, that tells them where there are disturbances under the ground, which may indicate a grave. Um, it's not always certain, especially when the graves are much older. So way up at the top where those uh, where these bushes are, where there may be burials way up there, it's been, those were started in probably 1850, and that's a long, long time to be able to detect anything, but here's hoping we'll be able to get a better sense of the exact perimeter of the cemetery and maybe uh, and maybe spaces where there are people buried and, and the number of those, um, those burials. Um, I'm hoping also once we know where those spots are to mark the graves in some way. Um, a headstone is a bit of a pain if you're trying to maintain a lawn. <laughs> Everyone knows that they're, um, you know, weed whacking around them can be difficult. So what I'm picturing is more of a, like the USGS um, flush marker, a little circular metal marker that's um, stuck in the ground, and so you can mow over it. It's less, um, less maintenance. Can be discovered again with a magnet if it grows over, but just a way to mark um, the burials that we're able to discover. So that's my plan. There are a few moving parts on that, but um, we're hoping to do that to continue to learn and. and um, dignify these people who are buried who, who may have been forgotten otherwise. Holly, other than yeah. the number, uh, is there, and the information in the, the book, mm -hmm. there is no other information on the individuals that have the tombstones? Sometimes there is. There, um, we have, there are a few other books that were like a day book when people came to the facility. Their, their um, data was taken down and a reason why they were there, their age, their nativity sometimes if they were from another country or from the U.S. Um, so some of those details are recorded. Some people came and went a few times and so we have a few data points on them. People show up in the, cemetery, in the uh, census and uh, sometimes in the newspaper. So if you have a name, there are ways to research some people. I have to say, if, if um, you know, the more prominent you are, the more publicity you get in life. So sometimes people who are not, you know, they were struggling in some way, don't always make it into the historical records, so it can be tricky to research them. Um, but there are other records associated with the facility that the, that the um, managers created, and we're, we're lucky to have a lot of those. So in some cases, yes, there's more to learn. And like the Smiths, we only have we have a few entries on them that give us an idea that they did live there at one time um, and what was going on for them. But the other information I was able to discover through the census and maps and um, other genealogical resources. So you kind of have to, it, it's never just one answer. You have to look a lot of places to put things together. That's just a historian's work, though. That's what we always do. Um, so... Uh, I'm hoping. I'm hoping after we get some of these projects done, we can do another dedication of sorts. Or um, what I'd really love to do is have kind of an adopt a grave day, where you can bring a flower to a grave. So I will be announcing something like that once we get this together. It's, it's slow moving to get these processes happening, but I'm hoping to do that. And um, in that way, we can help to dignify the people buried there and make the cemetery a beautiful place um, and a restful place again. Um, so, as we were... Oh, yes. How about mm -hmm. ownership? The county sold the cemetery to or the county still has that? Right. The county still owns the cemetery plots. Okay. Yeah. The they land around it, so actually Walmart now is over here, um, right back there, and and then the, uh, the three brick buildings and surrounds are, out, are not the county anymore either. But this little square where the cemetery is and then another strip along Volunteer Rock Drive are owned by the county still. Yep, so it's so they, they are responsible for caring for it. Yes. Isn't there some gravestones across from the new medical building? Yes. Yeah, that's that is Volunteer Drive and so that's the more recent cemetery. 
Um, this is the this one was established first, but then they moved burials up along, and that road was built. It actually it didn't it wasn't there at the time. It went right through an old farmstead, if you remember that. But those those ones up there have initials and an age. I have been able to match through a lot of different records. Um, potentially match full names to those initials um, to, to identify some of the people there as well. That's part of the 325 people okay. um, that we're able to identify. And that cemetery was used, the last burial I can find a record of there is 1940, which is not that long ago at all. No. Um, potentially the last person to be buried on county property, um, as far as I know. Um, they, so, they don't have to pay taxes anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they escaped <laughs> one thing. Uh, so as we reflect on all this important history, are there any words you would like to add or subtract from this? There we go. <laughs> or we can leave it as is, just if you wanted to add or subtract anything. I think we hit most of them. I mean, wait, there all these all these things are still true. Um, I just, I, I hope that you understand a little bit more about who might be buried there and their stories. Um, because this is a difficult history, um, but the, the records that we have are important to understand better. Um, and do what we can to remember the people who live there and who are still kind of residents there in some of this. So, yeah, more questions? Well, in 1918, I did work at the county hall. Yeah. The park, so there's farm up in Verysburg. Okay. And those two big white buildings. They house the women in one and the men in the other. He was always upset about that because some of them married like 50 years or whatever. Oh. And they separated them. Yeah, I think it's a lot like the Smiths. They probably had to had to live like that because it was the rule. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure people had gone around the rule sometimes, but that was the idea to try to keep people morally straight and narrow, I guess. <laughs> I mean, there is an aspect to this where there was a reform idea of reform, like if people were put to work on the farm and um, living in kind of an institution that maybe they would be able to support themselves better in the future. Obviously, that's it was probably fairly misguided. Um, maybe it gave people a leg up, but some people it might not have helped very much to be put to work like that. Yeah. Yes. Now the, the big cemetery is that just north of those three buildings you were speaking about? It is. Of? Yeah. Yep. It is. So you just walk across a, a bit of lawn behind those three buildings, and there's a gate, a little white fence, and then that cemetery is right there. Um, if you keep walking, you're almost at Walmart, so it's right between. Yeah. What kind of work did they do there? They worked on the farm and in the house mostly, so it was that was kind of divided by gender too. So men would be expected to work outdoors and in the farm and taking care of animals more. Women, if they could work, were probably helping with laundry and cooking and processing food and things like that. Um, women may have worked in the garden a little bit or gone collected eggs or something. I don't have exact records as to what people did, but it was pretty well split between people. Um, and then, so some people could work and some couldn't, and that was understood. But people weren't forced to work um, generally if they were there because of because they were struggling financially or because they were injured. If they couldn't work, that wasn't a problem. They were here for it. As best as they know how at the time. <laughs> I keep qualifying it because our ideas have kept evolving. So, mm -hmm. here in your presentation, I grew up in a house. They had about fourteen to maybe twenty some rooms, mm -hmm. and we were three girls first born from the family on the farm. And my father needed help. Of course, I'm about five, six years old, seven years old. And this man came to live in the service quarters of our house, mm -hmm. our old house. Mm -hmm. And he was from Willard. And I never really understood oh, wow. where he came from till tonight when you're talking about oh. that help that came from Willard and they had needed help and they brought this man to live in the service quarters to help with the farming oh, until we reached the age of about 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember his name was Beefy. Now, I don't know why that was the name. Uh -huh. That name resurfaced, and I'm thinking that's where it came from, and that's where yeah. the Willard was. That's probably true, yeah. I know when you just, it, it, Willard is like a one name, it's recognizable as one name um, in this area. Well, at least at that time. <laughs> right. it, it was just like, oh, yeah, Willard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Were there some women burned in a barn? 
Yes, I think you walked in just walked after in that. Later. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, 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 totally fine. I can reiterate. Um, yeah, there, it was when there was only one building. The, the easternmost was the first building, and the only one. Everyone lived in that one time before it continued. The population grew, and they needed mm -hmm. to build new buildings. Um, there was a wooden structure at the back of that building where where women who were having some pretty serious mental illness um, troubles were they were housed in there oh. and the fire um, they couldn't they couldn't get out so oh. it was a really it was a huge tragedy and did change some um, it changed the building practices they went to just brick they realized that was a little bit safer they thought it was a little bit safer um, expanded and changed some other like exit strategies sort of like it's almost like the triangle waste fire of Livingston County or something it was mm -hmm. it was impactful and really tragic. Um, that, that yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you yes. think of the attic of prison farm. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's a shame they did away with that. I know. I mean, it can give some. It can give people a breath of fresh air, right? Right. Plus, they yeah. can grow food and stuff. That right. They can grow support. some of the things they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does help support, but yeah, that has been phased out in our modern age, I guess. But that's what they. That's what they built this on too. Move it to my last slide there. <laughs> if you were born in Dixon County and then moved and then didn't have money, could you still be there then? Ooh, um, usually the, the laws changed quite a few times, and so I think it would depend on when that happened. Um, but for the most part, if you um, got sick or <laughs> fell on hard times wherever you were living or settled, you would probably be cared for there of that place. They didn't really like to, actually it was a, at one time in history, I think in the early 1900s, it was a misdemeanor to bring someone in and say, oh, they're from this county, you've got to take care of them. Um, oh. If they weren't cared for in Allegheny County or Monroe, to bring them down to Livingston and say, like, here, you have to take care of them here. And, and if you were found out, that was a problem. <laughs> so because the county didn't want to spend money on it if they didn't have to, unfortunately. <laughs> so every county had a poorhouse? I think eventually most of them did. Um, the really early law, um, it's a good question, I was trying to answer it too, but most of the counties around us here did, Monroe did, um, also a farm, I think where Highland Park is today, more or less, mm -hmm. if you know where that is, the Lilac Festival and all, I think that's where their farm was. Um, Allegheny certainly had one in Angelica, and yeah, I believe I believe most did after a, lot, after a while. They needed to centralize the care, and then they decentralized it to um, more state and federal welfare systems by the mid mid um, 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. So the TB hospital, which is Murray Hill, did they have an associated cemetery for people who died there? Interesting. Yeah. No, they didn't that I'm aware of. Um, generally, people, I mean, I guess any, anyone can fall on hard times and not be able to pay for their care there. Um, but there is, no, there's not any cemetery on that property. So I think a lot of people came from New York City and such to come to those TB hospitals. Um, and many of them, I believe, were buried back in where they came from. Or local cemeteries, too. Yeah. Holly, yeah. Um, at least here, and I know from researching records here, that sometimes the, the towns would have to um, bury people who they would fight with the county over whether they were going to be buried on county money mm -hmm. or town money. Mm -hmm. And I know Oakwood Cemetery had a place, had spots that were purchased uh, by the town for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cemeteries also have pauper areas, yes, pauper areas mm -hmm. that the uh, indigenous people and other people, not indigenous, Indian, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. People would be buried who didn't have any other money, any that's other right. resources, they would do that. Yes, that's correct. I, I haven't figured out all the nuances of when that happened, but I'm sure there were plenty of squabbles over who had to pay for these things um, because it was all taxpayer money to support people um, in the end, either from town taxes or, or county level. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think sometimes maybe the Potter's Field were for people who were being who were living at home, but still um, having some sort of support given to them through either the t at the town level or the county level, um, and so that's probably where the, the the Potter's Field or Potter's section of the cemetery comes in. Um, yeah, that's right. I think the, the county cemetery spot was 
left for those who really have, there was no connections to the to family and the community left perhaps yeah any final questions I can stay around after too um, I have some handouts here for you they're basically what I talked about in a timeline um, a little bit about the buildings and the cemetery and my contact info is on the back if you come up with any other burning questions about really anything local history this this presentation um, anything you want happy to, to give it a shot for you so um, yeah, we can, we can keep chatting if you'd like. We've got okay, well, thank you. Thank you.